All right, so with the Fresnel lenses, one size did not fit all. There was a whole range of sizes of Fresnel lens. We call them orders. Uh, it ranges from the relatively small sixth order lens all the way up to the first order lens and one above that which is called the hyperradial lens. Uh, you can see a hyperradial lens here. This is at Makapu Point in Hawaii. It is the only hyperradial lens in the United States and I believe it's something like 20 feet tall. So that's pretty big. Uh, for reference, that is the third order lens and Point Vicente has a third order lens as well. Uh, so the difference between all of these uh, orders is their focal length. So from a sixth order, which has a relatively small focal length of about six inches, all the way up to the hyperradial lens, which has more than 50 inches. Uh, Point Vicente has about 19.7 inch focal length. So there's three basic types of uh, Fresnel lenses that were used in lighthouses. They had fixed beam lenses, they had rotating lenses, and they had rotating and flashing lenses. So what that means is that every individual lighthouse is totally unique in what the mariner sees. And what the mariner sees is called the characteristic of a lighthouse. There are nautical charts which, which describe lighthouses uh, on the coast, and they have these abbreviations that have been built to describe exactly what the, f the flash looks like. For example, the uh, Angel's Gate Lighthouse in San Pedro has a green flash, if you've ever seen that one before. Here we have a white flash, right? The old Point Furman warehouse, uh, lighthouse, there I go again. <laughs> the old Point, Point Furman lighthouse uh, had a white flash as well before they uh, di uh, disconnected that. All right, so all of these different types of characteristics were available to be done, and uh, the uh, buyer of the uh, lens would specify the characteristic that he, he wanted, and then the manufacturer would make it to that characteristic. Okay, for example, here's a rotating lens. This is the very first rotating lens that Fresnel built. He had multiple uh, bullseye uh, lenses on here. And then at the very top, he had these uh, uh, trapezoidal lens panels, which captured some of the light and brought it back to the uh, bullseye. Okay, this turned out to be three and a quarter times as powerful as the best reflectors on any lighthouse ever in that area. So for the mariners absolutely loved it. Okay, and not only that, the American ships that came over to France at that time, because it's all on the French coast, they saw these wonderful lighthouses and they came back to America and said to the lighthouse board, what's the matter with you guys? Why don't you buy these Fresnel lenses so that we can have safe lighthouses? What's going on? You know, so they, they put a lot of political pressure on them after they saw these wonderful things. All right. So these increase the duration of the flash by double that of the lens flash alone. So th they were able to make characteristics like different colors. Here's a white and then a red and then a white and then a red. Okay, some are white, red, and green. You know, uh, there's various uh, things that can be done with these panels here. Here is a fixed light like the, uh, like the huge hyper radial lens on Makapu Point is like this. It's a fixed light. It does not rotate. It's just there constantly all the time, 24 hours a day, okay? The one on Makapu Point can see, be seen for 28 miles to sea. It happens to be uh, 230 feet, I believe, above the sea on a point up there, and uh, boy, you can see it for a long ways away. Easy for me to say, there we go. So uh, flashing lenses are made, uh, were made originally by putting multiple bullseye lenses in here. Right, and every time the light goes through one of those bullseye lenses, it would flash out to sea. And in between, there would be a dark spot. So it'd be flash, dark, flash, dark, flash, dark. Uh, here's a group flashing lens, very similar to the lens that we have. So uh, when, the light go when the thing is rotating around the light, this flash lasts a lot longer than one single bullseye lens would last, right? So, and here's one that was done on Bell Rock, uh, right off of the coast of Wales in the UK. And uh, this was actually a double lens, top and bottom, and uh, had flashing uh, characteristics on it as well. All right, 
And then there was the occulting way, and what they had was a, a thing that looked like a can, and a can came down over the top of the lighthouse, of the uh, lens, I should say, and then dropped and pulled back up, and came down and pulled back up, right? So that was an occulting lens. And uh, they had group occulting and uh, several different kinds. So each individual lighthouse in the whole world is unique in this characteristic. And that's very important so that the uh, mariners can, say, can uh, tell one lighthouse from another and be able to triangulate their positions based on that and know exactly where they are, how far offshore they are, so that they won't run into the uh, obstructions. All right, so here is our Point Vicente characteristic. We have a 3 tenths of a second white flash, and then a 4.7 second is called an eclipse, a dark spot and then a three-tenths of a second again, and then 14.7 seconds as a dark spot. And this happens, if you add all these up, it's 20 seconds, right? So 20 seconds, that means three revolutions per minute. So three of these cycles happen every minute, all right? And when we get it here, unfortunately, it's not going to rotate in our room. Uh, the Coast Guard will not allow that because it's, uh, it's dangerous and it will, um, it, it could cause wearing out of the bearings on the bottom, and then the thing could fall and stuff. So they make you uh, install it as a static display, right? So we will not see a characteristic. Okay. Okay, so who made all of these lenses? Well, first you have to look back to 1665, way before Fresnel, way before his lenses. Uh, Saint-Cobain was the major glass manufacturer of France and it had ties to the French royalty back then. And so when uh, Fresnel first started to experiment with glass, he contracted with them to get glass. And then in the 1800s, things start to heat up as the lenses become more popular. So in 1825, you have Francois Soleil, senior and junior. And then in 1838, you have both Jean-Jacques Francois and Augustin Henry. And then 1844, you have Theodore Letourneau. And 1848, you get your first international competitor, the Chance Brothers of England. They were one of the first to be manufacturing Fresnel lenses from outside of France. And then 1852, you have Louis Sauté. Two years later, you have Henri Lepote. 1862, Barbier and Fenêtre. He is very important, Barbier. Uh, we will talk about him in a little bit. And then 1866, you've got some German competitors now with Nietzsche and Gunther. 1870, you have Sauté Le Monnier and company. 1894, Barbier comes back again with the second iteration of his company in Barbier and Bernard. Uh, 1896, Germany again, you have Wilhelm Vohl. 1899 is the first time that the U.S. starts to manufacture these Fresnel lenses with the Macbeth Evans company. And in 1901, Barbier comes back again with the third iteration of his company in Barbier, Bernard and Turenne, otherwise known as BB&T. And they are very important because they are the manufacturers of the Point Vicente lens. Um, the company was also known as BB&T, and they stamped all of their products with a seal that looked like this, uh, starting in 1901. And that is important because there is a little bit of controversy surrounding when the Point Vicente lens was manufactured because we have at least three sources that say it was manufactured in 1886 and sent to Alaska for 40 years before it came to Point Vicente. However, we know that is false because, uh, like I said, BB&T were the manufacturers of this lens and they only were a company from 1901, so it couldn't have been made in 1886. Also, we know that there were no lighthouses in Alaska until the year 1902, so it could not have spent 40 years in Alaska. Um, also, our lighthouse here was built 1924 to 1926, which means that the lens would have had to have been built between 1902 and 1924, which means it would have never been in Alaska. So if anyone tells you about Alaska, just say that's not true. Okay. So myths debunked, huh? All right. So how do you rotate a really heavy lens like this and keep it rotating at exactly a constant speed? 
because it can't go faster on one day and slower on the next day or you won't have the right characteristic. It's got to be exactly right. How do you do that? Well, the problem has been friction. When these revolving lights uh, uh, go around like that, they cause friction due to their ga great weight on the base of the things, right? So, uh, and they were driven by these clockwork systems, which we're going to show you in just a minute. And they're very, uh, extremely slow. And so, the one revolution in eight minutes, if you can imagine that. Now, the point vicinity lens rotates three times a minute, right? So, in the ancient days, before they had electric motors, they had these weight-driven things, like a grandfather clock, right, and one revolution in eight minutes. Well, at the length of the flash would be like 20 seconds or more, and the interval between flashes would be a minute, maybe. Now, if you're a mariner out at sea and you miss the first flash, you'd have to wait for a long time, right, to see the next flash. And, so, and uh, it wasn't very effective at all, right? So the clockwork was driven by a real heavy weight that was attached to a cable around, wound around a drum in the clockwork mechanism. And some weights uh, went up and down in a special channel built in the side of the warehouse tower or in the center of the tower. And others uh, descended uh, inside of a tube in the central, center of the tower. And others were right in the middle in the center of the tower hanging out in the open. Okay, so this is what those clockwork mechanisms look like. There was this drum that contained the steel cable, and then uh, all the weights would be attached to it. And these were what they actually looked like, right? So some of the French style ones there on the left, and uh, more of a British one there in the center. And the, and the Chance brothers are the British fellow, fellows, and they developed a real fancy one there on the right, okay? So this is what actually powered the rotation of the lamp, this weight pulling down on the cable which would then connected to a bunch of gears, right, and caused it to rotate that way. Well, it, it would be okay if the weight was inside the wall. That'd be no problem. It'd be okay if the weight was on cables like this because it wouldn't go all over the place. But if it was right in the center of the tower and hanging right over you, and you had to be walking under it when the steel cable broke, you might have a problem with that, right? So they figured out that, uh, that the a uh, steel cable would wear out over a period of time, and if it should break and the uh, cable and the weight fell down, it could damage the whole thing. And so they figured out how to do that and uh, where to put the weight and uh, where to protect it. So the better way to do it was to build a sand pit like this, and they actually put a railing around it so that you wouldn't walk underneath the uh, weight like that, and then if the thing actually fell, it would be protected. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so, so that's a, a real fancy. There are actually some lighthouses around that still have this system working, no kidding. And they've been completely restored, and the same exact clockwork system is, is available. Okay, every uh, four hours, the poor old keeper has to go there and wind the cable and bring that weight all the way up to the top. And it's not an easy job because that cable, uh, that weight weighs over 100 pounds. And he's going to have to wind that. So he has to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and go wind it and again at 5 o'clock in the morning and wind it. Right? So not easy for him. This is a typical pedestal showing you the gearing that is used to rotate the pedestal based on that clockwork. Okay? And uh, to keep the speed constant all the way around, the rotation speed constant all the way around. They borrowed from the technology of steam engines at the time to control the rotation speed of a steam engine. They use these regulators, okay? Don't ask me how they work. I have no idea. I, I know that they are uh, uh, borrowed from steam engine technology. They cause a, a constant speed of rotation based on some principle here. Okay, here's, the, I, I really wish I, I could scientifically explain it, but I can't. But th this is what they look like uh, off of a steam engine and off of the uh, uh, steam, uh, the regulators of a uh, clockwork mechanism, okay? All right, so then they were driven uh, by gears, and uh, this would be the ring that con contains the lens itself, okay? And some of the uh, gears were on the inside of the ring, and some were on the outside of the ring. Doesn't make any difference. They both turned the ring so that it, it uh, would turn the lens, okay? 
And then finally, we got to the uh, modern era of electricity and the electric motors were invented about 1904. And that would be prior to when Point Vicente was built. And so we, had, we were a very modern installation at that time. In 1926, actually 24 through 26, when they built the lighthouse, they put an electric motor in and uh, it was driven by that electrical generator that I showed you before, all right? And here's another electric motor uh, operation just showing you how that works, okay? Okay, so now we have another problem. So how do we support the weight of an extremely heavy lens and keep it rotating at a constant speed? So like Paul said, the enemy here is friction. And uh, because of these uh, earlier clockwork driven uh, machines, uh, you could get one revolution in eight minutes. And that was very slow. It would also be a flash of 20 seconds and an interval of nearly a minute between flashes. So that was not sufficient. We needed something better. And so one solution people came up with was to install a bunch of those bullseye panels uh, around the lens uh, so you wouldn't have to rotate it quite as fast. And so with one lens that had 24 panels, bullseye panels, uh, you, could, uh, you could have the, um, a much, much faster uh, flash and speed of rotation relative to what was prior. So you can see here, this had many, many bullseye panels here. And that was a very complicated uh, building process. So we still need to solve our problem with friction. How do we do that? We need less friction to make the lens rotate faster while still supporting it. And so we had three main uh, support methods. We had wheels, we had ball bearings, and mercury float systems. So uh, Fresnel himself was the one that came up with the wheel support system in 1822. Uh, which worked pretty well for the uh, higher order lenses, the smaller ones. Uh, but if you tried a wheel uh, support system with a larger lens, one of the first or second order lenses, there was still too much friction and the wheels would wear out quickly. So we still need to improve. So now we have the ball bearing system. This is the kind that's in the point Vicente lens. It's what's supporting it. Um, it was able to support an entire lens using a system of these ball bearings. And it worked pretty well. It was created by the American engineer, David Heap, in 1898. And it reduced friction some more, and it was easily maintained. But still, we have friction, and we do not want friction. So what can we do? Well, we can float it in liquid. That will pretty much eliminate any friction there was. And so uh, Fresnel himself also proposed this system, the mercury float support system. Essentially, it is a basin of mercury, of liquid mercury, and you would float the lens in it. And that was pretty good. And why would you use mercury? Well, it is much, much denser than water, so you do not need as much of it as you would water to support a heavy lens. So you can see here, it is a basin of mercury, and in it, you would have a lens support ring that would be floating on it, and you would set the lens right here on top of it. And this caused an almost frictionless environment. That's what we were shooting for. But it almost worked too well. Um, you would get flashes of one-tenth of a second, and sailors could not see that. So that was a bit of an issue with these mercury float systems. Uh, but they worked pretty well for their goal of reducing friction. Here you can see some different kinds of mercury float support systems. And here it looks like someone is maintaining it. That was another drawback because as we all know, mercury is not the safest substance. And when these maintenance workers would come and empty the basin, as they would have to do occasionally, there would be all these fumes and just badness. So that was not a great thing about these mercury float systems. Yeah, the, uh, the people that maintained them would sometimes kind of go mad because of these fumes that would be given off. And that was a definitive drawback to this system. But hey, we don't have friction anymore. so. Is that? Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the human history of our lighthouse, the Point Vicente. 
Uh, as you know, it was built between 1924 and 1926. If we go back even further, uh, Vanderlip wanted to build an artist colony on the point. And so we have the model of the artist colony in our history room, don't we? All right. That was what he wanted to build. I have all these wonderful artists there and painters and woodworkers and sculptors and everything. And uh, so he, he went to the, uh, the federal government, said, this is what I want to do. And, but the sh ship captain said, wait a minute, that thing is a hazard to navigation, that point. Because that's where the land turns from north to south to west to east right there at that point. So it's, it's very dangerous. So we need a lighthouse there. And so he took him to court. From 1916 to 1921, he took him to court for five years, right? As part of that court thing, he had a French model maker make that model and took it into the judge and showed him that and said, how about this? Isn't this beautiful? And the judge said, you know, that's really nice, Frank. No. <laughs> and so he lost the case and he was forced to sell eight acres to the government under threat of eminent domain. Right, and so he sold the eight acres. Eventually, he had to sell them another four or five acres uh, from the Palos Verdes Corporation, right, to build the lighthouse. So they they uh, got title to the land. Uh, the federal government did in 1922. They started construction in 24. They finished in 26, and in March of 26, finally it went live, right. So from there. Uh, 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 way before then, uh, actually in Thomas Jefferson's era, the U.S. Lighthouse Service was formed. All right, and it was actually a separate organization, and it was under the Treasury Department of all wonderful places to be. And uh, uh, then in 1939, it was finally turned over to the Coast Guard. Okay, and uh, the, the, there was a big problem with it being under the Treasury Department because for a long time, from the Civil War period until 1900, it was run by a very skinflint auditor who didn't want to pay any money for these fancy French lenses. Forget that, you know, we'll, we'll do it on our own. No, we're Americans, we can do it on our own. Oh. And the ship captains are saying, we've just been over to France and they have these beautiful lighthouses, why don't you have the same? And he says, we can't afford them, and they, they could. But they didn't. So eventually that guy was drummed out of office and uh, they did get a few uh, demonstration lenses and it turned out to be the, the right way to go. And so Sandy Hook, right off the uh, port of New York, was the very first Fresnel lens that was installed in the USA. And then from there on, the whole East Coast uh, started getting them. So in 1939, uh, it was turned over to the Coast Guard. And since all California lighthouses were automated in the 1970s, the responsibility is transferred from the Coast Guard itself to the Coast Guard Auxiliary, which is a volunteer organization, okay? And uh, the uh, fellow who uh, directed the complete restoration of our Point Vicente Lighthouse, Eric Castrobron, is now 89 years old, okay? And uh, in the early 90s, he developed the whole uh, uh, restoration plan and they restored it completely, including the tower and everything. And uh, he, uh, now his son, is, uh, has taken over, in, uh, and his name is Kim, Kim Kesterbron. He is in charge of all of the lighthouses from um, Point Conception to the Mexican border, right? And he hangs out most of the time in Port Wainemi up by Oxnard, okay? But he does come down here every time uh, we have an open house for the lighthouse, Kim Kesterbron is down here. Okay, so back in 1926 when they opened the lighthouse, these were the first lighthouse keepers, right? We have uh, George Lamadou, and uh, we have uh, Harry Davis and Ben South. And these guys were really professionals, and they knew what they were doing. But uh, Mr. Lamadou here uh, was a curmudgeon. He was one of these kind of guys that uh, nothing is ever right unless he thought of it himself. Kind of thing, my way or the highway kind of thing, right? So he had a lot of conflicts with these other two guys. And so they actually um, lodged a formal complaint on him in about 10, 1931. And uh, <coughs> all of them were rec reprimanded. And, and after that, uh, this fellow, Leomadu, was transferred up north to Piedras Blancas. And he got along very well with the people up there, but did not get well, along well with these guys. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Later on, we had Anton Trittinger, a wonderful uh, fellow from Switzerland, brought his entire family here. His kids went to school at Malaga Cove School, 
They actually rode uh, farm tractors from here over to Malakov School every morning. It's pretty interesting. And, and uh, he is the guy who planted all of the palm trees and all of the landscaping there. It was a very barren place before that. He planted the lawn and the whole thing. Uh, he really did a beautiful job. I wish I had a picture of him. I, I searched like crazy, could not find a picture of Anton Trudiger. And then uh, part of his uh, assistant corps was this fellow Joe May, and Joe May took over right after World War II and uh, actually uh, was the last full-time uh, lighthouse keeper until they automated the lighthouse and uh, moved from there. Okay, so the lighthouse was automated in 1971. And this is a picture of Tom Atkinson, who was one of the first assistants in the early days, polishing a 1,000 watt light bulb in 1935. <coughs> now notice this. After 1945, they went to 1,500 watts. But between 1,000 watts and 1,500 watts was World War II. And in World War II, people were really goosey about Japanese submarines and other Japanese ships uh, being directed towards Los Angeles Harbor. So they took the light of 1,000 watts and replaced it with a 25-watt light bulb <laughs> during World War II. So, I mean, they literally uh, wiped out the functionality of the, of the lighthouse, right? It was just a little glow on the horizon. After World War II, and, and we won the victory over Japan, then they replaced it with a much bigger bulb, okay? And, uh, and after that, they went to halogen and, uh, in 1952. Now, I have a um, video here that was taken by a uh, local resident in uh, Palos Verdes, been, been a resident for 30 years, on Whale of a Day 2014. And he actually took a tour of the Lighthouse Tower and we're going to take you on a tour of the lighthouse grounds and the tower by video here and uh, show you how that works. This is about a nine minute video that actually goes through the tour. He can't spell lighthouse though, that wasn't my... Uh... <laughs> You notice he has some pictures of the PVIC here with the canopies up so that you can see that it's a, a whale of a day, day. So here they are touring the grounds. In 2015, they determined that there was lead paint that was peeling on the inside of this thing, and so they closed the tower for that reason. Also, the stairway itself started pulling away from the wall, and they felt it was unsafe for a number of people, so they don't let you go up there anymore. But this was about the last year that they allowed people to go up in the, into the liner room. That's the Pelican Air Force there. <laughs> All of these palm trees were the ones planted by Anton Trittinger. Now we're in the tower.
They very carefully controlled the number of people on the stairway, and that's a good thing. Notice how strong those windows are. Beautiful view there. You can see the canopies over there on whale of a day. Okay, now here's where we get to go up in the lantern room. Here we are. Notice the peeling lead paint. This lens actually has a door in it which allows you to get inside and change the bulbs. You notice that. There's the two halogen bulbs. Now they're not showing the back side that has been painted and the reason it was painted is to eliminate the ghost, 
that was um, out there that everybody said the lady of the light and all that stuff. Well, they put three coats of paint on the back side of the glass and the ghost went away. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> That's it. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, what is going to happen to the lighthouse? Well, there is still going to be a light up there. Don't worry. Um, we are going to get an LED-based beacon this time. Uh, you can see this is what it looks like here. It's produced by Vega Industries and the flashing characteristics will be the exact same, so if you're out at sea, you can still tell it's the uh, Point Vicente Lighthouse. And its range will still be about 20 miles. So Vega Industries, they are based in New Zealand, and they are one of the premier uh, lighthouse beacon manufacturers in the world. And they focus on incorporating new technology like LEDs and uh, remote capabilities to maximize efficiency and capability. And as uh, is probably clear, they are controlled remotely and are more reliable and require less maintenance. So it's a pretty good deal here. Okay, now when is the Fresnel lens gonna come to the PVIC? Not until the construction's finished on the display room. Okay, we have to have a place to put it before they will move it. And that's a pretty smart move, if you ask me. We don't want to store that thing anywhere because there's a chance it could get damaged real bad. So then a contractor will be engaged, and he'll come in with a great big crane, and he'll pull that thing out of the top of the lantern room somehow, put it on a truck, and bring it over here. And it will be mounted on some kind of a fixed mount, non-rotating. And uh, it, there will be uh, graphics, many pictures of the area. Uh, and also a 54-inch flat screen is going to be put in there, uh, upon which we can put a movie of some kind, maybe a portion of this presentation or something else in there uh, that would actually uh, explain the history and the background of the, not only the Fresnel lens, but the lens in this particular lighthouse. So I hope you uh, enjoyed that. This is the, uh, what's going to be in our museum uh, lately, uh, very soon, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing it. So we hope you enjoyed the presentation today. Thank you for coming.